AI seems to be um, taking over the headlines at the moment and it's sort of everywhere. What, what are your thoughts on the future of artificial intelligence? I'm scared, <laughs> very scared. Also, um, yeah, just like as a humanist, you know, coming from um, uh, you know, uh, basically a social science background, uh, for me, it's very scary the concept of uh, technology optimizing itself, at, you know, without serving a use case that's like in our daily life. Gabriel, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Awesome. So, you're the co-founder of CoinRoll, which automates crypto trading. So when building this, you went through Y Combinator, which is really cool. And it's a dream of many entrepreneurs to, to get accepted into YC. Okay. What advice would you give to people that are, I guess, thinking about or going through that application process to, to begin with? Yeah. <clears throat> so, the reason we got into YC, funny enough, is because of our revenues. So we didn't have any magic formula or any hack to get, uh, to get uh, into that accelerator. We were growing extremely fast. I think we did a, a 16x uh, on the revenues from like, um, in like three, three months, four months. Uh, and the market, the crypto market was booming and that's why we, we actually got under the radar. And um, yeah, so the, the one thing that I would, I would recommend is be very straight and direct in, in the application. Uh, they don't want to really uh, see like a lot of things written or any big narrative. They really want to see your metrics and then very specific metrics they care about that you can find on their website is MRR, uh, you know, customer acquisition costs, lifetime value, the, the, the most typical one. And they want to see this one rights and then they want to see that uh, the, the co-founder are really uh, committed to it and really like uh, they, they've been knowing each other for a while, but also that the mission they're solving is much, much bigger than the actual product itself. So they like when a business has um, a vision that really covers some big uh, social uh, problem instead of just like a, a small specific uh, feature product that can be just like uh, overwritten by any, any big competitors. Yeah. So uh, I think you know, good metrics, um, having also a good pedigree is good. In our case, it was a mixed one. It was not really a typical uh, Ivy League uh, university pedigree, but that really helps. Okay, because a lot of the stuff that you mentioned there, I think YC actually tell you this on their website. They almost tell you how to get in, yeah, yeah. but people just ignore that and they don't read it and they just they just try to apply anyway. Yeah, exactly. Also, like when they ask you to, to film the video, they, you know, some people do like, puts up like Hollywood style uh, productions where actually they just want a normal video to see like, you know, who you are. Yeah. Uh, and um, the funny part is the interview actually. Okay. It's like 10 minutes, you get this in front of these four people, yeah. you know, super, super high achievers. And uh, they just like bombard you with questions and you need to be really like, focused enough to reply and write all, all the questions. And then they ask you also some, uh, some more documents of diligence because they really wanna, wanna see the actual, the actual they lack like data. So if yeah. you can show that, you are in. Okay, so you've raised over 3 million from, from YC, from the founders of Twitch, Fitbit, 8sleep and, and so on. What, what tips would you give to other entrepreneurs on raising capital? Because a lot of people that I speak to, they're struggling to get their first dollar, never mind you know, like 3 million or, or whatever. Um, go to US. <laughs> it's much, much faster. Uh, I mean, we did our, our we raised the 3.3 million in three fundraises. The first one, funny enough, I mean, I'm Italian, but I've been in London for like more than 14 years. And uh, we had to go to Hungary to actually uh, do, do our first acceleration program and get the first tickets in. So the first one was like 200K. Uh, led by a bank, MKB Bank, um, very conservative bank, and a couple of angels. And then we did a, a crowdfunding campaign on Cedars, but those two, they were as hard as the, the y, y Combinator uh, uh, actual fundraise. Uh, so I think if you go to the US, I mean in meetings where like, you know, you pitch literally for five minutes and uh, they, they wired the money after 10 minutes, literally. Yeah. It, the, 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 the cost of doing startups there is higher in terms of admin and bureaucracy, but uh, all the funding process is much faster. Uh, and I would say like, um, if you join YC, obviously the demo day, uh, it's like 60 seconds, one slide, and then you get basically a, a, lot of, a lot of leads that you can convert very quickly within a few days. Yeah. Um, but in terms of fundraise, I think it's just like perseverance. Perseverance, also being uh, bullish enough and believe in your, in your vision and mission as well. Uh, do your homework. I mean, a lot of, I see a lot of entrepreneurs going in fundraise with not really the right metrics. I mean, there is no point. Yeah. Right. If you don't have like that nice six months growth uh, that 
the, the unit economics are in place, there's no point in going fundraise. I mean, you can obviously find some small tickets, you know, uh, people get really um, excited about your ideas and everything, but if you're not really serious money, like, you know, a proper, like, seed two, three million upwards, then you need to have the right medics in place. Otherwise, like, don't waste your time because it's a full-time job, right? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's a lot of, a lot of bids there as well, uh, a lot of um, warm introduction that you can get, and you need to kind of massage all of this, this all the network to actually get to a point where like you can you can sign the time machine and those metrics so uh cac customer acquisition cost ltv lifetime value um arr annual recurring revenue like w- what else is important or are those like the main ones i think that the main concept of you know what to basically want to see right you put money in somewhere there's a machine and you have a multiplier uh, I mean, that, that, that's the idea, right? So I think something that demonstrates that you can basically invest an amount of money, you can basically acquire customer, and you can retain that customer. So uh, a lot of entrepreneurs at the beginning, they forget about retention. Um, I like retention more than churn because churn is a kind of, it, there's a negative connotation almost where retention is actually, you, you know that you can increase that retention by, by connecting the growth with your products and by having specific journey and improving on those journeys. Um, so I think that, that retention, so there's the acquisition part that in a way I find it very easy. Mm. Uh, but then the retention is actually much harder, right? Because that's the indication, you know, if your product is really a fit for that market. And, and you know, once you have that 40, 50% retention after one year, you are on something big and you can basically inject much more money. But it's also a good indication for you, right? Because I always find that there's also a founder market fit. Mm-hmm. So basically, the founder, you need to like the industry where you're on. And some, some founders are not really fit for specific sectors. So uh, I think that's also something that you need to discover probably before getting into a startup. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So we've talked about investment there from the perspective of raising it. If we flip it to the perspective of um, making investments, you've invested in a, a few projects from, from quantum software to transportation. I guess I've done um, some angeling uh, over the past year. What, what tips would you give to people that are looking to invest themselves, maybe as angel investors or, or whatever, and they, you know, what, what, what should they look for? What, what are the common trends or founder characteristics which are important when, when backing people? I think all the people that are backed are basically like stubborn, <laughs> very stubborn. stubborn. Okay. I mean, the, the, the quantum company, I, I knew the guy very well. So I knew that, you know, it's like super top notch academic guy, you know, Stanford, yeah. MIT. But then uh, we always knew that you're like a very good commercial, uh, commercial side. So I think yeah, you, sh- you should look for that. They want to make money, so commercial side, uh, they need to be stubborn um, and they need to also have the stamina to understand that uh, you know, they're skin in the game and they're there for the long run. Uh, and then obviously you need to fall in love also with the, with the, main, uh, with the main project they're doing. Like uh, the other one, the transportation company was in Climatech. And funny enough, they pivoted without saying anything to the investors from like building like uh, electric airplanes uh, to a marketplace for pilots. Uh, so they market didn't, people, they didn't tell their investors. No, nothing. You, know, uh, you don't get like uh, an investor updates for months and months, and then all of a sudden, oh, by the way, now we pivoted, and potentially, you know, teaching new pilots to drive, you know, old school planes actually, uh, it's not good for the for the environment. Uh, and I invested in a climate tech company, right? Yeah. So it's like kind of big pivot against the, the initial values, and actually, some of the investors we managed to get some money back, like uh, from that investment. Yeah. Interesting. So stubbornness, persistence resilience. It's kind of tying back to what you mentioned earlier about characteristics when, when going into YC, but just people that won't give up, people that, that are willing to do what it takes to, to win. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, like the cockroaches, right? That's how Paul Graham called them. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, you need to be able to, yeah, to just like go, go and go because it's, it's a long run, right? It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And uh, yeah, you need to have a lot of energy and motivation as well. Um, there's a point where uh, also the founders, they, they get bored of doing because you do an enormous amount of admins at some point. You know, pre-series A, there's a lot of admin and basically there are not many compa- people in the company. So you end up doing those things where you actually want to do product and those can really drain your energy and, and you know, you need to also basically be creative enough to create momentum always with new projects and new features that yeah. make sense. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So you're in the uh, blockchain, web free crypto space. W- what are your thoughts on, I guess, the, the future of that industry? Because um, on one hand, there's so much value that's, that's being created. Um, and on the other hand, there's so many bad apples in, in that world as well. So what, what are your thoughts on the future of that space and, and sector? Yeah. It's funny you say that. I just, I'm just back from the ATCC, one of the biggest components uh, yeah. of, the, of Ethereum. 
uh, the bad apples. I mean, that is like 90% of the projects, they get cleaned up uh, in every cycle and that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and then they're like, uh, the, the main, if you see the main project in, in, the, in the Web3 space or blockchain, however you want to call it, but uh, you know, they're like uh, some good stable coins, you know, like, like Circle, like um, USDC, like you know, USDT, and they're like solid there. There are some good exchanges, some DeFi protocols uh, that do like, you know, all sort of market data, uh, you know, uh, arbitrage and rebalancing. Some of those are like very solid and you can find them across the years. Even Uniswap is a very good company, Consensus as well. You know, they build good product. But then there is a lot of noise. Mm. And, and, you know, it's an industry that I love because eventually it's going to basically change the, the finance as we know it today. Yeah. It's going to converge and it's going to, we're going to see probably the same process we saw with telecommunication when VoIP came about, right? So at some point, the, the retail space, um, you still will still buy like um, data plans, mm -hmm. but actually the back end will be VoIP and then at some point people will understand that they are buying just data. Mm -hmm. And that's now, w w the phones are basically, run, basically on data, not anymore on, on other infrastructure, right? And that's gonna happen in finance too, you're gonna have blockchain coming on the back end as a technology, very technical, deep tech, and then at some point the banks will become more and more like just providers of specific retail products, but they, it will be much more clear that they will be just the end part of the chain, okay. right? And now, with the blockchain, there is, there is, we are at, at a moment where we are passing uh, that phase where there was pure speculation. Yeah. Um, and now we are actually getting more into the actual real world apps. Um, and and I'm, I'm really enjoying this transition also because, um, you know, being like for 10 years in that space, you can see that they only need mostly for speculation, but they really build a lot of narratives and story, lying to themselves why they're in it, yeah. but they all disappear during the bear market. Yeah. So I think that's like the, the stuff that I don't like about this space, but all the rest is amazing also because like, you know, there's several components that are amazing. You know, yeah. the, 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 the decentralized ledgers, you can have your own wallet, you can the concept that you are basically having your own data and plugging your own data wherever you want, doing whatever you have to do, unplugging your data, and still you are, you are kind of, uh, controlling your funds and your wealth. There is no third party provider that can access uh, your, your personal data anymore. Hey, this podcast is brought to you by weloveAlpha.com. If you're looking to grow and hire and scale your software engineering team in the UK, then go to weloveAlpha.com to hire the best software developers on the market. Everything across Java to C Sharp to PHP to Python to React and Angular and mobile and more, go to weloveAlpha.com to hire the best software engineers in the UK now. Definitely, I'm, I'm with you that it's it's clearly the future of money, of, of, of data, of verification, and and many, many, many other use cases when you when you look at the wider blockchain. Um, within the, like the wider web free world, um, there are other technologies which kind of get thrown into that group, like like VR or, or AR or, or the metaverse. Um, rightly or wrongly, they're they're part of like web web free, right? Um, I appreciate it's a little bit different to, to to what you do, or actually quite different. But because it's such a connected world, what are your thoughts on I guess the future of like VR and AR and, and the metaverse? I mean, they will all converge, right? Already now, like um, there are some very good uh, games that are like you know running on blockchain. Uh, it makes total sense even if the technology is not yet there. So I've been in games where you play and then you get points and you need to sign the transaction with your Meta, Meta, MetaMask wallet continuously because you get points continuously in, in, in a battlefield, right, in a video game. Um, so now with the, with the new uh, announcement with the Ethereum protocols, the new ones, you can have like uh, allocation to specific smart wallets. So you can actually collect automatically points and those points are actually real token, real money that goes actually into your wallet. So, I mean, the, I think it's, it's a perfect marriage between, uh, you know, VR, AR, the video games, the AI as well. If you put AI with smart contract, it's basically the evolution, right, yeah. of, of all that um, automatic uh, wealth adjustment that happens with mortgages, that happens with loans, even with inflation. What would be scared is like, you know, what's happening tomorrow politically, right? Who, who's going to govern those, those, those systems? So, yeah, as usually, probably the, the concept of uh, state and uh, decentralization will really not probably match. So we will have some bad uh, case or situation where it would be misused. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, those one will teach us that we probably need a public entity 
to kind of um, not regulate, but also to co govern a little bit the blockchains and how the blockchains are used by the people, how the dApps are using by the people, and how even the video games and AI and VR are used by the people. But I think this, the, the, you know, the public, um, the public realm always comes a little bit after the technology. So I think we, we need to wait for that probably 50, 100 years. Yeah, 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 I hear you. Okay, so we've gone through like some of the, the most mainstream media type uh, headline technologies there we, we were talking about from from the blockchain to to the metaverse i guess the last one of the of the trifecta which you mentioned is ai and ai seems to be um taking over the headlines at the moment and it's sort of everywhere what, what are your thoughts on the future of artificial intelligence i'm scared <laughs> very scared also um yeah just like as a humanist you know coming from um uh, you know uh, basically a social science background uh, for me it's very scary the concept of uh, technology optimizing itself at, you know without serving a use case that's like in our daily life so i'm, I'm really scared of what's what's happening because it has been cooking under hood with with you know with alphabet and meta and all these companies the big ones um, for a while now, actually, we see you know the, what, what what we needed is like one retail product, ChatGPT, to actually understand what was going to happen, right? Um, but still, again, you know, after this small application, we are going back to kind of all the ML is going under the hood again. So it's going to be like still the domain of of uh, more like you know combines that that you know use weaponry and use like all, all sort of you know hidden um, hidden. Uh, tools to actually do stuff that are not really under the control of the, 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 the public good. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, AI, obviously it's like, it has accelerated extremely fast. We need to see what happens, but yeah, personally, I, I would like to actually have more like education around that, even at uh, you know, school level, like, you know, yeah. A grade, A level and stuff. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, on one hand, it, there's so much value that's going to be created. You mentioned linking it with smart contracts and, and the obvious implications that that can have. But on the other side, we are entering the unknown and there's a lot that we just don't know about. And I, I'm scared as well a lot, a lot of the time. With this. It's funny because you can uninvent inventions. Once they're out there, like everyone uses it. Yeah. And this is the worst AI will ever be. It's only going to get better and better and better. Yeah. I think, I think Elon Musk also had a fight with Larry Page because of that. Like, they're on two different like, part of the spectrum in this, where actually funny enough, Elon Musk is one that really wants to serve the people. And then yeah. Larry is actually convinced that technology will be like, just you know, outperform every human brain. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the argument was that, uh, that I think Larry called Elon a specious. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, which, which kind of says he, he, he wants the, the human race to, to, to be what's in charge and not, not some AI um, overlord. And um, I mean, who knows what's, what's going to happen? But I guess, look, it, 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 for me, it's impossible to predict this because we, if AI truly becomes sentient, we won't know for sure because it, it might tell us that it's conscious, but we have no real way of proving that. So is consciousness uniquely biological or can it be replicated by a machine if you give it enough computing power, enough GPUs, enough BAMF? It's hard to answer, but what do you think? Could, could AI become self-aware? I mean, totally. I mean, the, the good example is the, um, you know, it's funny how the cinematography always arrives first, right? There was a movie Ex Machina, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, a, that's a, exactly what, what you mentioned, like, you know, they were totally like, um, yeah, imitating normal human behaviors, showing compassion, showing all sorts of sentiments for then, you know, going to the end game of basically, you know, dominating and then uh, reverse the, the course of history. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, we could be here yeah, talking for hours about philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could, man. Um, let me ask you about uh, a past experience that you had. So on the Choosing Leadership podcast, you told a story about how one of your engineers secretly had two other jobs at the same time. So you had to coordinate with other founders oh. to, to exit them from the business. Well, maybe that's an old one, because then after that, we had another the three jobs. Wow. So. <laughs> So yeah, yeah. This is um, called being overemployed. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Like a, it's like a trend. And I personally, I, I would, I would never dream about doing this. But um, I have, I have employees. I have a team. If I found out they were doing this, that would, I, I don't know what I'd feel betrayed. But um, t tell me about that because that's a crazy story. There's a lot of threads on, on Reddit about those those over over um, overemployed, uh, you know, people, yeah. and uh, they're a lot of fun. Actually, I think well, a Chinese lady got. Uh, 
yeah, I got incarcerated because she had 52 jobs well, at some point. Okay. <laughs> well, that's that's fraud at that point. That's totally really. fraud in China, yeah. like, you know. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not against the concept of, you know, having a flexible, you know, work-life balance and having two, three jobs, as long as, you know, you're just, like, transparent with the other. So, I think in our company, we have a, a disclaimer every year that a form that you, you fill in, and this guy was literally, uh, like, uh, like uh, basically, yeah, hiding the two, two jobs. Um, yeah, so I had to coordinate with a company in Canada, a company, another company in the UK to fire him at the same point. And funny enough, one of the companies, they didn't want to do it. because They were like, look, for the amount of money we pay him, because this guy was in, uh, in Egypt, it was like, it's good enough for us. He may do whatever he wants, but it's good enough for us. So yeah, as people, you know, if, depends how, how also you perceive your employee, right? If you see them like as a commodity, just like, you know, input, output, that's one thing. If you see them like someone that you can nurture, invest on, it's, it's a different thing. But yeah, the trust is the main thing in a company. A company is basically, by definition, a group of people, you know, uh, working on something together. And so the, the connection within these links are basically trust relations. Yeah. So yeah, once that one, yeah, it's, it's gone. I, I, I completely agree. Man. Yeah. I mean, we don't work for money, right? I mean, we work to have like purpose in life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure. How how did you find out? I'm I'm, I'm curious if, if you if the stuff that you can't say I, I can just cut it by the way. But um, how, how did you find out that he was working multiple jobs? I mean, first of all, there's always like um, a bit of um, some some signals you can get from the people, like you know, uh, work hours. They're not slack. They're not too slack. The way they reply, the way when you actually ask them questions, the way they actually react, they get defensive. But then, uh, I mean, literally, this guy, I went on LinkedIn, he had like uh, two, three jobs. And, uh, so he had it publicly advertised on LinkedIn? On LinkedIn, yes, wow. yes, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, and then another thing that uh, works very well, actually, against those things is actually uh, making that employee very visible on LinkedIn. As a company, you can actually award them, you can celebrate his anniversary, you can make him he's very, very visible. So other companies that may be working with him, they could actually, uh, you know, notice how actually he's working for you, he's working also for me. So yeah, that's another thing. But yeah, uh, there's no really way. In, the, in this world of remote working, there's no real way to, to, to know yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah so. No, it's a difficult one. Um, so I imagine you then had to find the founders on LinkedIn of the other companies? And yeah, 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 yeah. Contact them and then coordinate. Interesting, man, interesting. <laughs> um, but that's not, all, not the first time that happened. You know, at one point, I usually go by country, I explore countries uh, in terms of um, recruiting right people. And then at some point in Nigeria, I discovered that Nigeria is a very good pool of talents. Yeah. So at some point we had like eight people from Nigeria. Uh, but then uh, I understood that the, the standards are very different. Like the way they perceive front-end development of back, it's really different from our standards. Yeah. So actually, if you, when you go for the quantity, we use basically the quantity just to go and actually then keep two, three key elements kind of as a screening almost element. So we know that a recruitment process can run for six months between interviews, yeah. employ them for three months and then screen them out. Planning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they are contractors, so it's fine. Yeah, yeah, very, very different model. Like, yeah. like, you know, we have a recruiting company and all of our developers are in London and it's a very different type of person and what they can build as opposed to completely different skill sets in different parts of the world. For some companies, that's what they need. For other companies, they, they need this. And it's great that there's different options out there for different people based on what, what, what they need, basically. But, but it's funny, there's not yet like a, a universal token of uh, something that says that this guy, you know, there's all the reference on this token and this guy's good, you know, it's reliable. There's nothing like that yet. Yeah. It's, it's very funny. Like. Putting references on the blockchain, it's... Uh, exactly. I mean, someone should do that, really. There we are, co-founders. That's it, perfect. <laughs> also because every time you get a new job, you need to ask all your previous references for, like, you know, to sign documents, so yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it, there's definitely an opportunity there. Um, okay, so you have been a mentor to Google, an advisor to Harvard University. What, what, what do you think makes a good coach and a, and a good leader? Coach is like giving the, the tools, the frameworks, uh, show them how to use them, uh, and then let them run, and then go back and maybe just like, you know, uh, give a nudge here and there. Uh, during the exercise by not basically asking the right questions but not giving them the solution otherwise you're building their company and actually also you know they're usually more knowledgeable in that domain than you yeah, yeah. Uh, especially in google it's like uh, an upper acceleration program one week uh, every day is a, sp a specific uh, subject i come in for the design or the product day either tuesday or wednesday and you spend like you know one day with three startups right and uh, so you basically, it's like at school, you give them exercise, you go to the other company and you basically uh, let them think and develop like specific customer journey, 
or a specific like problem there, like you know, around the go-to-market or like you know, give them some good references. What about on the leadership side? Yeah, so so coaching, I really liked that you're not doing the job for them. You're just giving them the framework and some some direction, helping them. Uh, you know, if they bump against the walls, helping them get back on track, but but not doing it for them. What about leadership? How, how is that different? Leadership. I mean, the the, the you mean coaching leaders or coaching so. No, I, I guess I guess when you're leading your your team, I suppose. Oh, okay. You know, because I mean, they're very they're, there are lots of similarities, right? I mean, but but yeah, there are, there are also lots yeah. of like, are all good coaches leaders? I don't think so. Are all good leaders coaches? A lot of them, but not all of them. So yeah, yeah. I mean, because I mean, most of them, like you know, now we recruit very senior people, and most of them they're like better than me in their domain, right? Yeah, so yeah. Um, so I, I basically I, I let them go, and then when I see that they are diverging from uh, what was the, the the basically the main mission, I kind of come in as like, look, yeah. you know, let's go back in track, and sometimes. Um, it need to be harsh because they, these people are like uh, like smart and they know what they're doing, but they can also be pretentious. So sometimes, like you know, you need to be very strong in, in, in kind of redirecting them in the right position. I think leadership is like you know pushing them from behind. Um, but I mean, the way I do it, I really I'm, my model is really collaborative. Like. Uh, that's because I come from design and that's how you do in design, you do workshop all together, right? Yeah. Sometimes people are not used to it, so even when they ask to, you know, to actually chip in with ideas and, 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 and they don't really like it, so it's very difficult to get the introverts to talk or like to express their, their, their ideas in some ways. But then uh, the summary of all the, of all the opinions plus the, the, the quality, quantitative data that let me really take the right decisions and then to actually go back to the team and actually structure the, the, our vision on that direction. Usually they follow you because, because it was their idea in the first place. Yeah. Um, so yeah, th that's usually what I do 60-70% um, of the time. Some other time I switch to command and control, really like, you know, this is what you're doing, I want this by this time. And, and, and if you're if you enough, clear enough, and you have big objective, uh, I think people, they have no choice. They get, either follow or they go. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. This is a quick message to tell you about Alpha University. Alpha University is an advanced training program to help you reach success in seven simple steps. I am going to personally coach you so that you can achieve your goals, make more money and transform your life. Just go to joinalphauniversity.com now or click the link in the description. Yeah, no, there's, there's different times for different approaches, right? And yeah. I, I love what you said around hiring really senior people and, and kind of trusting them to do it because if you try to micromanage everything, it's, it's, just, it's just not going to work, man, is it? You know? It's also impossible. I mean, I think I'm a better um, wartime CEO than a peacetime CEO. Uh, luckily, there's my co-founder. He's like uh, very diplomatic, very nice. So he's very good when uh, everything is good. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you mentioned you were in design um, before you got into, I guess, yeah. I guess building and running a company. So mm -hmm. what 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 makes a beautifully designed product? What, what what makes a product that's designed that people want to keep coming back to and want to keep using? Mm -hmm. Design is it's a definition of how thing works, not how it looks, right? So. Um, it's an experience, obviously. So, it's design is a process. As, as a, you know, so people really, especially in other languages, they, they misunderstand design as a kind of you know the drawing, the visual part. But it's actually it's how the the program, the program makes you feel, how it's perceived by the users, and and what makes a good product is basically when there's a seamless interaction between uh, any product it can be a glass or can be any interface, but it has to be very seamless. Uh, it has to present the right information at the right time. So there's always the dis disclosure of information that needs to be very well thought out so that you give the right, uh, um, the right solution at the right moment in the journey. So I think when, when you find that nice harmony and choreography between the human and whatever product, if it's a software or hardware, then you find something that's like um, beautiful. For example, Dropbox, right? It's a great UX. You, but you see it's like, it's pretty like slim and, and uh, you know, it has like, few colors, it's all white. Basic, it's actually yeah. very basic, yeah, simple, but then it works very well for what it has to do, right? So I think that that's, uh, I think design is good when you don't notice it. Okay, I like that. Design is good when you don't notice it. Mm -hmm. I like yeah. that. Dropbox went through YC. Yes, as yeah, well, yeah, yes. Okay. That's with Stripe, Airbnb. I actually got mentored by um, uh, Brian Chesky from Airbnb, oh, wow. it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I've spoken to Brian before. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, it's very, very cool. Yeah, it was a little bit of our, my role model, so. Okay, was, was there anything I'm putting you on the spot here, but was there anything that Brian said which has stuck with you? Yeah, it, it was a group, a group situation, but then uh, he told us how uh, they went through basically COVID, that they had to fire 80% of the of their personnel. And, and what struck to me is like they 
they, they, they build an intranet to allow all these people to find new jobs in Silicon Valley. Basically, they really cared also of the offboarding of the, of the, of the, of the users, of all the, all the team and the recruiters. So it was very, very, very important. And also uh, how they, they, they went back to the roots and they start crap, you know, scrubbing off all the old projects, all the, all the side projects, and they just focus on, on the fundamentals. Yeah. And that's what you know, we've done. Uh, we were like 24 in my company, yeah. and then uh, after the bull market, uh, you know, we went to, down to 10, yeah. and life is much better. Yeah. yeah, because especially if you've got like 100% market, product market fit, if you just employ more people, you're just amplifying your problems. Mm. You're not really solving it. So I think you should first find it, you know, 100% product market fit, and then you can scale up the team, right? Yeah. And we were in that situation. But now, uh, and also another thing with the founders, and that's what also I learned with the, with the Brian Jensk, is that um, basically you are in that stage uh, when you're a small company, when you need to go from delivery to basically a little bit more strategy and more management, mm. and you find a place where you're like in two, three spaces, and it's very difficult to manage. Uh, so I think when you are still a small team, you can just be on delivery and the decision making is very fast and forget about all the uh, H&R management, the long term strategy, all the management on people and all those problems that you get yeah. when you scale up like, you know, quickly. Yeah. So, yeah. So actually we brought in also a, a professional CTO okay. when we scale up. Um, yeah, it was very good uh, as well. He brought like you know, a lot of good state of art um, kind of and best practices as well. Uh, but um, I think like now that we're smaller, we felt that probably we didn't need them anymore. So yeah. One thing I love about Brian uh, Chesky and, and the Airbnb story, um, two things actually. Um, firstly, they have a, uh, an extreme obsession with, with the customer. Um, so Brian would, I mean, he still does, literally to this day, despite being a billionaire, he has random people come and stay on his, mm. on his sofa and, and in his spare bedroom. Um, and I love that because he's so involved, like he physically went to the people's houses and took the photos to put on the website yeah. himself. And the second thing I like about the Airbnb story is how uh, it's an example that all you need is a, an idea and an MVP to, to, to start. You don't, you don't need to spend years and years and years building something. So when Airbnb launched, there was no way of making payments on the platform. Mm -hmm. You had to physically speak to the person and figure out a way to, to, to pay them. Um, you couldn't do it on, on the app. There, there was no map view on Airbnb, so you couldn't like look on a map on a Google Maps <laughs> to, to see this stuff. It was super, super, super basic. But all they wanted to do, I think their tagline in their, in their pitch deck was, um, Airbnb helps people find rooms with locals instead of hotels, or mm -hmm. some version of that. And it was such a simple, easy idea. MVP, super, super, super basic, and an obsession with the customer journey. Yeah, I think mean, the difficult part starts after, right? It's not just like MVP, but then you need to iterate it, and that's what everyone forgets. Yeah, they want to like it. Yeah, you yeah. I mean, because it's it's a hard work to talk to. I mean, we do a lot of user research, we, you know, but talking to like hundred people every month, and then also you get all this material. You need to summarize that, to find the patterns, classify them, have label, labels then solutionize those and then put them in the, into a proper process. So all that work, uh, you need probably a uh, user research full time, uh, or you need founders that are really like, uh, you know, into, the, into that, uh, into those things. Uh, we have designed a user research in our DNA. Mm -hmm. So actually me and Michael Fanny, we do a lot of that. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's very strange to communicate to investors on them, right? Because they're used to this um, imaginary of the, the tech co-founders that always like building stuff that's super smart, but sometimes, most of the time, me and Michael Fanny, we remove stuff from the platform. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know, we talk to users and sometimes, you know, the best action is no action or just, you know, declutter. Uh, yeah, in yeah. fact, I mean, if you go on Control now, the interface is still super clean, yeah. uh, even if the machine in the back end is, is very, very powerful. And we have the opposite problem now. It's like that basically we need to make the machine look more complicated because our customer base are used to this, like, you know, super cool uh, dashboard, like these super cars, you know, where you have like a lot of yeah. indicators. So we need to make it look more like that. So yeah, it's, it's funny to come from the other side of the spectrum. Yeah, that. no, definitely. I mean, you know, less really, really can be more uh, a lot of the time. And, um, but at the same time, it depends on what your customer is, is used to. It can be too much of a jump to, to strip everything down to, to complete the basics sometimes. I can't remember who I heard this from, but they were talking about the uh, sign up experience to their platform. And traditionally there's what, username, email, password, confirm password, click to factor authentication or something. And they went, 
why don't we just do a, a username and then you click it and then you get a password emailed to you and then and then that that that's it mm. and and they it turned out it was it, it, it didn't work because people it was too simple too much of a leap and people didn't know where to sign up they thought it was a uh, a sign in form rather than yeah. a sign up form yeah changing a behavior that has been there for like i don't know 50 years basically you want to change it. it's better probably but then you know people don't know and then they, they get all the sort of emotional reaction inside and that's what you have to manage emotional reaction yeah yeah in our in our space in, in the training space it's uh, they used to like overcrowded like dashboards with a lot of data yeah. that make no sense sometimes and when they come to us like oh there's nothing here for me like you know and they don't they don't know what to do with that like simplicity and i'm so yeah we need to find the right balance between the two. yeah customer education piece but behavioral change yeah, yes. I'm, I'm a big fan of entertainment actually education and entertainment together because yeah. that's the only way you can really keep people uh, you know on their toes yeah yeah what, what do they call it Ed, edutainment edutainment yeah, yeah, edutainment, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. like no, uh, duolingo is a great uh, example of that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what we're doing now to a smaller degree, right? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, uh, final question. Um, last year, you tweeted, great things rarely come from comfort zones. Step out and watch how you evolve. And I loved that. Let me repeat that one more time. Great things rarely come from comfort zones. Step out and watch how you evolve. Can you tell me a little bit more about, I guess, why you tweeted that, what, what you meant? Uh... It's interesting. Maybe like, I mean, because that's, I do it every week. I do, I try to do once a week something that gets out of my comfort zone. Yeah. So tonight I'm going to, um, I think, a breathing meditation with some like electronic music and visuals. Cool. cool. Yeah, sometimes I, I find myself in situations like, why am I here? I but do one of them every month and they are amazing. Yeah. Exactly. And then I did the, the floating bath thing, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's all like new things. Um, so maybe in that situation I'd like, some discussion or fight with either a friend or some of my partners okay. or like but that's why but uh, I, I really think that that what makes you grow right yeah. um, it's just like some point you know your comfort zone is so wide so that like you know you need to find always like new things um, and maybe that's the time when you need to go back to the root and look in, inside right and then and then maybe like you know read some some of the good books that you have on, on your on your list probably yeah. like but yeah I mean I'm really fine of that uh, the comfort zone I mean also what is comfort zone because I mean, as an international, like, um, I mean, immigrant founders, like in the UK, or I, I lived also in the US, but you really, like, you have time to, when you do this, like, cross-country uh, businesses, or when you, when you go to university abroad, you have, you're young, and, uh, and these are, like, the big jumps that really change your life, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're, like, the, the, the jump and, and, and the expansion you can have, you know, your comfort zone, when you're younger, are much, much bigger than what you have when you're 40 or 50. So I think those are the opportunities, uh, you know, early, uh, the early age of your, of your life. After, I think, like, you know, that's it at some point. Yeah, 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 no. And so many people, they get uh, stuck, I guess is, is the right word, in that comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And they're just in it for years and years and years and years, whether that's being in the same job for forever and, and not feeling that, that growth and challenge and adventure, or um, whether it's just you know, a mindset thing. And, and it's not just about business and work, it can be yeah. your, your relationships, your, your body, your health, your, your mind, whatever. And it's so important just to continuously push the boundaries and, and do things which make you really, really, really uncomfortable because that is how you get better, that, that's how you grow. But you see how humans are so multidimensional, right? That you, the comfort zone can expand from uh, your daily behavior, your mind behavior, like anything that I, I really find hard to, to think that AI can actually all this like bubbly, multidimensional, like, you know, experience of life. But uh, it will come at some point and we will basically yeah. succumb. Probably, I mean, maybe like AI, it, it will maybe change everything or, I mean, we are in the hype bubble right now, so may maybe it will only change a few small things, I, I, who knows? But I mean, it's only been around, I mean, AI has been around for a long, 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 long time, but mm -hmm. it's been mainstream around for like, you know, a couple of years. And, yeah. um, but the, the fundamental principles of being a human, they haven't changed yet, you know? In a way, but, but if you feel like there are some big trends, like, you know, I really believe that mobile phones are basically are changing, basically they're programming us with mobile phones yeah, yeah, yeah. because you always have the same behaviors, right? The same authentication behaviors, you know, with your thumb or with your pattern. So we are all doing like basically how many millions? I don't know. What's the adoption of mobile phones now on the planet? Like, probably that must be like 80, 70, 80 percent or something. Yeah, yeah. like penetration is huge. So everyone is actually accessing the mobile point the same way. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a way already to program the human beings. You know? yeah. Even with pornography, pornography now everyone has sex the same, the same, almost the same way, basically all around the world. Yeah. It's crazy if you think about it. So there's been already these huge phenomena that have like standardized yeah. the way we do 
you know, relevant things in our life. And I really think that gets closer and closer to the machines, basically. Yeah. So the singularity is is near. It's it's coming closer and closer and closer. Yes, totally. Yeah. yeah. I, I definitely do see a very real possibility that um, in the next uh, you know decade or two decades we will start to basically merge with technology and and become a. Uh, it's, it's funny because Beckett Junior was part of the trans architecture movement. movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually uh, goes into you know cybers and you know transhumanism. You know, basically plugging hard drive in your in your brain and stuff like that. But I mean, that would be probably the transition. I mean, in some way, if it's done like you know, uh, in a conscious way, yeah. I wouldn't mind it that one. Yeah, I mean, we're already doing it subconsciously. That I mean, I'm wearing a, a smart watch on my reading my pulse. I've got a, a phone in my pocket 24/7. And I have, these are not smart glasses, but I do have smart AR glasses as well that, that I wear most of the time. So um, we are already half cyborg but it's just outside of us when we start to get to neural link territory and it becomes in us then it's kind of kind of too late <laughs> to go back really at that point yeah that's true, that's true. Yeah. yeah cool man all right um this has been uh, a really really good conversation on everything from i guess hiring building companies investing crypto ai the future and, and beyond and um, for people that have enjoyed this and they want to check out your, your platform they want to learn you know more about coin rule where should they go what, what's the website i think uh, coinrule.com obviously but then there's uh, the twitter our twitter is very very uh, animated with a lot of uh, cool content uh, we have a good blog with a lot of educational content if you want to learn more about crypto how to invest we actually also have stocks as well for more conservative people so yeah uh, i think we are we have a huge presence online there's a lot of uh, material also on youtube Cool. And all those links are on uh, coinroll.com? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And then if people want to learn more about you, I guess your, your LinkedIn would be the best place? Uh, LinkedIn, uh, you know, on Twitter, I'm Fresh Muse, uh, or they can just send me an email, gab at coinroll.com. Okay, amazing. All right, Gabriel, thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Hey, thanks for watching this podcast. Make sure that you like, subscribe, follow, comment, etc., etc. And I'll see you in the next episode.